On the night of October 24, 2025, a Cirrus SR-22T descended into the quiet mountain valley of Lincoln, Montana, and never made it to the runway. A few days ago, the NTSB just released its preliminary findings, and together with local reporting, a clearer picture has started to emerge of what happened in the final minute of that flight. It's a heartbreaking accident involving a respected Spokane businessman, Dan Arada, and a high-performance aircraft that is normally one of the safest in its class. Let's take a look. When you first read the NTSB's preliminary document, one thing becomes clear. This accident unfolded very quickly. The aircraft, a Cirrus SR-22T, registered N740TS, departed Spokane around 8.10 p.m., heading southeast toward the small town of Lincoln. This is a night flight into mountainous terrain, and although the weather was reported as VMC, night VMC in a valley is very different from daylight flying. Shadows become black voids, rising terrain contours flatten, and the runway environment can seem to appear all at once. ADSB and recoverable data module information show that the approach into Lincoln was not a single straight-in path. Instead, the airplane crossed over the highway near the airport, then maneuvered near midfield with flaps transitioning between 50% and full before returning to 50%. None of this is unusual by itself, especially for a non-towered airport where pilots often adjust their positions to set up for landing. But in this case, it placed the aircraft in a confined area, low to the ground, with changing configuration and limited visual cues. As the aircraft maneuvered, terrain awareness and warning system alerts began to sound. A few seconds later, the stall warning activated. The aircraft pitched up, power increased, and then ADS-B data recorded a steepening left bank and a rapid loss of altitude. About 3,300 feet short of the runway, the SR-22T descended into trees and terrain. A post-impact fire consumed much of the airframe, but investigators were able to reconstruct the sequence using onboard data, eyewitness video, and the debris pattern. At this stage of an investigation, the NTSB will not assign blame or propose a cause, and neither will we. But we can examine the facts and begin to identify the key elements that stand out. Low altitude maneuvering at night, energy management during a configuration change, terrain alerts, stall warnings, and a developing bank angle that never recovered. Each of these deserves careful attention. Before we move deeper into the analysis, though, it's important to acknowledge the human side of this story. Local reporting identified the pilot as Dan Arada, a well-known business owner from Spokane. He was traveling to meet family for a planned hunting trip. By all accounts, he was a dedicated father, a respected member of the community, and an active general aviation pilot. Friends described him as someone who loved flying and took pride in doing things well. The last 60 seconds of this flight are crucial because they reveal how quickly a small chain of challenges can tighten around a pilot, especially at night in mountainous terrain. According to the NTSB, the aircraft was descending into the valley at Lincoln when the Terrain Awareness and Warning System, or TAWS, issued alerts. These alerts are designed to warn pilots that their projected path is trending toward terrain. They don't mean the airplane is about to strike the ground at that exact second, but they are urgent cues that something about the flight path, altitude, climb rate, or horizontal position needs immediate attention. Just seconds after those alerts, the stall warning activated. That's a critical moment, because now the airplane is in a combination of two very dangerous regimes, proximity to terrain and a low energy state. When a stall warning sounds close to the ground, the margin for recovery shrinks dramatically. The RDM data indicates that power was added and the aircraft began a climb. But during that climb, the bank angle increased sharply to the left. This steepening bank is significant because a bank increases the load factor, which in turn increases the stall speed. In other words, the airplane might have been climbing, but the energy available to support that climb was insufficient for the turn that was developing. At nearly the same moment, the autopilot and yaw damper disconnected. That can happen for several reasons, the pilot taking manual control, the autopilot sensing it cannot maintain commanded parameters or a system reaching its limits. We don't know the exact reason yet, but what we do know is that the airplane transitioned into full manual flight during a high workload moment. For any pilot, that is a challenging transition, especially at night. 
ADS-B returns show the aircraft's indicated airspeed dropping into the mid-50 knot range. For an SR-22T in a bank at that density altitude, that is almost certainly within the aerodynamic stall envelope. The left bank continued to steepen, the nose dropped, and the aircraft descended rapidly into trees about half a mile from the runway. When we piece together all of these elements, TAWS alerts, stall warning, steepening bank, autopilot disconnect, and low airspeed. We're looking at a scenario that investigators will analyze very carefully. Each factor on its own is manageable, but when they occur simultaneously, in darkness, close to rising terrain, the pilot's available options and reaction time are dramatically compressed. This is where we will turn next. The technical discussion of why the aircraft behaved the way it did, and what questions the NTSB will be asking about systems, configuration, and pilot workload. To understand the final sequence, we need to examine how the SR-22T behaves in the configuration changes noted in the preliminary report. This is a high-performance, turbocharged piston aircraft with excellent climb capability, but like any airplane, it has very specific handling characteristics at low speeds and high flap settings. The data shows the flaps moving from 50% to 100% and later back to 50% while maneuvering in the valley. Now, selecting full flaps is not unusual during a normal approach, but what matters is when and where the configuration changes occur. Flap deployment increases lift, but also significantly increases drag. Imagine driving up a steep hill and suddenly shifting into a lower gear without adding power. Your speed will decay unless you act quickly. In an airplane, that speed decay can happen quietly and fast, especially at night when the horizon isn't as clear and the pilot is relying heavily on instruments and peripheral cues. The NTSB's data suggests that shortly after the configuration changes, the aircraft was in a series of turns while descending. That combination, turning, descending, flaps extended, and possibly reducing power, can very quickly place the airplane close to stall speed. And in a valley, even a small reduction in climb performance can matter. The terrain doesn't care that the airplane is configured for landing. It's simply there, rising, waiting for the airplane to clear it. But the critical link in this chain was the stall warning itself. A stall warning in a turn already means the airplane has far less margin than the airspeed indicator might suggest. In a 30 to 40 degree bank, an airplane's stall speed rises noticeably. Add in nighttime illusions, possible task saturation, and the natural stress of a TAWS alert, and you have a situation where the pilot's workload spikes within seconds. One important point, the airplane did climb when the pilot applied power, which suggests the engine was producing thrust. But as the left bank steepened, the wing's ability to support that climb diminished. The recorded bank angle, combined with the low airspeed, would leave almost no room to recover, especially in the tight confines of a valley and at night. These aerodynamic factors don't tell us why the airplane got slow or why the bank developed, but they do help us understand why the airplane behaved the way it did once the stall warning sounded. Investigators will be digging deeper into these precise moments. This brings us to the human side of cockpit performance. While the aircraft's data gives us the what, pilot psychology helps us explore the why. Again, this is not about assigning blame. It's about understanding the pressures that can quietly shape a pilot's decisions. Lincoln Airport is a small mountain airfield at night. The runway is lighted, but the surrounding environment is very dark, and the valley walls create a shadowed bowl that can distort depth perception. Even a highly experienced, conscientious pilot can underestimate how close the terrain is. Night flying often provides fewer cues, and when you descend into a valley, the terrain rises on both sides, which removes the natural horizon reference that pilots rely on. Investigators will almost certainly consider the possibility of visual illusions, black hole approaches, false sense of altitude, and the compression effect of runway lights can all trick the mind into believing the airplane is higher than it really is. If the pilot perceived he was above the ideal glide path, he might have reduced power or used flaps to descend more aggressively, completely reasonable actions in many situations. But the environment at Lincoln is unforgiving. A pilot can be on what feels like a standard approach path and still be much lower than expected. When the TAWS alert sounded, that may have been the first objective cue that the aircraft was closer to terrain than anticipated. Next, workload must be considered. A night arrival into a dark valley demands sustained attention. 
small adjustments in heading, altitude, flaps, power, and descent must be continuously monitored. If a pilot is also thinking about runway alignment, runway length, or whether he is properly stabilized, that mental bandwidth fills up very quickly. And when the stall warning activates, especially low to the ground, the pilot has to process multiple urgent demands simultaneously. Pitch, power, roll, terrain, and configuration all compete for immediate attention. Even a short moment of disorientation or fixation can accelerate the situation into something unrecoverable. It's also worth acknowledging the emotional context. The pilot was flying to join family for a trip. It's not unreasonable to ask whether get their pressure played a minor role, not recklessness, but the subtle human tendency to complete the mission after a long day, especially when the destination is familiar or meaningful. This is something every pilot can relate to. None of these factors exist in isolation. They intertwine, often invisibly, until the airplane reaches a point where very few actions will reverse the outcome. Investigators will look carefully at these human elements because they're often just as important as mechanical or aerodynamic ones. Whenever a Cirrus accident occurs, people naturally ask whether the CAPS parachute could have made a difference. In this case, the preliminary report shows no deployment, and the flight data suggests the airplane was extremely low when the situation became critical. CAPS requires altitude, time, and a relatively stable attitude. Three things this aircraft simply didn't have once the stall warning activated and the left bank tightened. This isn't about a missed step. It's about physics and the unforgiving timeline of low altitude loss of control. The wreckage pattern and post-impact fire tell investigators a lot about the aircraft's final attitude and energy state. Even with fire damage, they can still examine control linkages, flat positions, the propeller, and the autopilot system to determine whether all major components were functioning normally before impact. As the investigation continues, the NTSB will study the complete RDM dataset, engine performance, pilot experience, night flying history, and the unique challenges of approaching a mountain airfield after dark. They will also consider whether visual illusions, valley winds, or workload contributed to the sequence. Ultimately, this phase is about learning, not judging. So the aviation community can prevent similar tragedies and honor the life lost in this accident.